General Tibbetts, here we are at MBA 2004 where we're celebrating business aviation entering the next century of flight. Right. Obviously, in the previous century of flight, you've had quite a bit of historic impact on aviation. What are your feelings when you look back at some of the aircraft you flew way back in, in your day and now here in uh, what we see out here at MBAA? Well, I tell you what, it's, it, the transition from those days to this day it might have taken 40 some odd years, but it seemed like yesterday to me. Uh, yeah, I got some old wire and canvas uh, airplanes. That, they weren't as old as I was, but they were damn near that old. And uh, I enjoyed them. But I think the biggest thing I can offer in this regard is, you see, in those days that we're talking about early, 40 years pre-war, we didn't have power to do what should be done with an airplane, with airplanes. Yeah, I never flew an airplane that had enough power until the jet came along. And uh, it was a handicap, very much so. Now we're going to, they're talking about having supersonic business jets. Well, I think that's wonderful. But on the other hand, I think those things are going to be less than useful because of the noise made. Now, I understand that they've got a way of conquering some of that noise, and that's great. But uh, we're going to, if we, if we get those supersonic jets going, that will, that will be another hundred years pro worth of progress. You know, they announced the supersonic business jet as a sort of a next evolution of aircraft design. How does that fit maybe back to the B-29 when you flew that aircraft? Was that seemed as revolutionary back then? Well, I don't know, but I mean, of course, the, the B-29 uh, is not in a class with what we're talking about. But it, in its day, it was the, uh, the best as far as a commercial, I don't mean a non-commercial airplane, a military bomber, uh, the advances in construction, the use of materials, uh, the learning curve to find out how these things took so much and that allowed them to compare the thing with the jet engine uh, only in the fact that it was a development thing over a period of years. The jet engine, I think, developed uh, probably in less than 30 years. But those engines that I'm talking about, reciprocated engines and everything, they had a historical background of 75 to 80 years. And uh, I got to fly some of the earlier ones. I mean, I don't. maybe you've heard of an OX-5 engine? Yes, I believe I have, sir. <laughs> well, that was a Liberty that was developed during the war, World War I. And... Uh, I got to fly an airplane called a Bird, which had that engine in there. But as my instructor pilot, before he turned me loose, said, don't fail to know where you're going to put this thing down when the engine quits because it's going to quit. And honest to God, he was right. I, had, I flew it two times and it quit both times, <laughs> on days apart, of course. But uh, the fact it was, it was fun. Uh, it, there was something about those old things. It's kind of like old automobiles. They have a lot of charm. Not so much usefulness, but charm. And I, I just, I get carried away with uh, with some of the uh, things. Uh, the Learjet, which I had more experience than anything else. Uh, that was a fine airplane. The only thing matter with it, it couldn't stand up in the cabin. And that, of course, is a, uh, a drawback to the airplane. They're, they've gotten past that one, but uh, there was nothing as far as an aviation extreme from props to the jet. Uh, the Learjet did it. Well, you mentioned the Learjet. Obviously, you're no stranger to business aviation. You uh, had a, quite a hand in, in launching the executive jet pro, uh, company program. Tell us about your involvement with the executive jet. Which, which one? With the uh, with the executive jet. Uh, net jet. Uh, pardon me, net jet. Well, I didn't. I don't have any involvement with net net jet. But I was one of the three founders of e executive jet using Learjet airplanes, and we had to struggle as things got better and so forth and the 
lack of a stand-up cabin really hurt us and uh, that sort of thing. But the one thing that I did, and I think Warren Buffett uh, saw that when he, he bought Learjet. And he thought that was just a great, uh, great deal. And the things that we did with, the, with those airplanes, I put a lot of military thinking into it because the prop guys that wore scarves around their necks and boots and, you know, and all that kind of stuff were individuals, uh, individualists as such. And they wanted to do what they wanted to do. But uh, executive jet, we built a very solid foundation there. That, uh, one thing I brag on is we had one major accident which was because altimeters hadn't been repaired correctly. That killed Walter Ruther in, in about 1964. Uh, other than that, well, we had those and several places that were in the airplane business using altimeters had the same problem. So can't blame my pilots. We, it was a circling approach to Pelston, Michigan. But after that, there have been no accidents haven't been any, any scratches. So I think we did, we laid the foundation into what you see today with the sophistication in the corporate aviation world. And, and, and definitely aviation, business aviation, corporate aviation yeah. has evolved since then. Uh, you're out here in MBA also celebrating your, little, your historic uh, flying. Talk about the book that you've been promoting here at the show at MBA. Well, the, there's so much, so many things get wrong in history because they're not understood correctly and so forth and of course the use of the atom bomb was one of them and uh, what I'm trying to do is to uh, convey to the younger generations and people that will listen that what we did with those things was something that honest to God it had to be done because uh, today history will will show you that the uh, the uh, Polish, you know, the Russians, uh, and the Japanese were talking about dividing up the, the world. That the Russians would take the Western Hemisphere, the Japanese take the Eastern. But the, again, that stopped them because we we had so much bloodshed in World War II that when this came along, and I was. Direct. I was told that I was going to drop the bomb. I mean, that you know, you're, you're going to do it. I, I thought, man, you picked the right guy, because I want to do it. And uh, while I'm at it, I put that thing together from nothing. I put it together and dropped the first bomb in less than one year, with with a real trained outfit. But that showed the world the power and the destruction that can be wrought by those types of weapons. Nobody's used one since that time. And I would like to think that nobody will ever use one. Today we don't need them because sophistication has come up in, in weaponry and guided missiles and everything else. You, when you could put a, a B-2 in the air with 16 bombs in it and control them and you can go through one, you've got a building there, which wind do you want me to go through? And that sort of thing. It's 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 mind-boggling, but we don't need them. Uh, and I would hope and pray that we never have another war where uh, blood was shed as badly as it was in World War II. So what I'm saying, I was determined to be successful in the effort, and my whole business and my, what I told the guys, we will stop that killing. And that's all I could say. Well, I appreciate uh, your sentiments on that. Obviously, war is something a lot of people want to avoid, and I, I've really had a pleasure talking to you about aviation's past, present, and future, and it's been an honor to talk to you, sir. Well, the future is bright. I don't know. I'd like to. I was born too damn early. <laughs> Today, they're doing things I've always wanted to do. I always wanted to have the biggest airplane that was built. I wanted to fly them. I was, you know, being trying to show off or something like that. I said, I would like to have an airplane in which the number four co-pilot would have to feather the engine.
course, that's <laughs> ridiculous. But on the other hand, they didn't make a big enough. Uh, I would love to be able to fly one of these big airplanes today. I've done it in simulators, not all of them, but I mean, I've I've flown 707s, 727s, and so forth uh, in American Airlines simulators because the guy that was in running the this, this training business, a friend of mine, mm. and I'd get in there every now and then and say, you want to make a flight? And I'd say, sure. <laughs> we get 15, 20 minutes in the simulators. And uh, those are wonderful training guy, uh, pieces of training equipment. Well, sure. Thanks again for your time, General Tibbetts. It's been a, a, a real pleasure talking to you today. The what? It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. I appreciate your time with us today. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I like to talk about them. But I don't know everything about him. Well, no, pretty much though. That's for Thank sure. You. Thanks Thank much, you. sir. I appreciate Thank it. Okay. <laughs>